Hello everyone, Dr. Robert Stanley here. Thank you so much for joining us today. We're going to get started here in just a second. Let's just take care of a little housekeeping. Today what we're going to be doing is we're going to be removing an anterior tooth in the aesthetic zone. We're going to be using a fully guided system to place an implant. We're going to gap, uh, graft any gaps that are in position and we've already prefabricated a long-term provisional that she will wear while she's healing. In the aesthetic zone, we find that it's very important to maintain the papilla. We don't want to lose the papilla. So a lot of what we do today is going to be surrounding that. So let's get started. First thing I want to do is I want to show you uh, what we're working with. So let's, let's go to do the radiograph real quick. All right, so you can see here on the radiograph in the seven position, we have a, an existing implant. The eight position, the crown has fractured off of the gum line and it's previously root canaled and then there's a crown on nine. So we're working between two kind of uh, uh, sticky situations. We don't want to knock that crown off on nine, and we don't want to damage any bone uh, around the, the, the distal of eight and the mesial of seven where that implant is because that implant bone doesn't uh, hang around very well if you, if you damage it. So let's, let's get started here. So the patient's already been anesthetized. 15 blade. And we're going to start using a 15 and a round scalpel handle. I love these round scalpel handles. This one's from Hugh Friedi and allows us to do a very, uh, very pencil-like movements, um, very tactile feel to it. So we're going to just go down here, intracellular here. I don't want to lay a flap here, okay? I, I, I'm going to do everything we can to do this flapless. And the reason is, is that we don't want to compromise that blood supply. And uh, many of the things that you're going to hear me talk about today come from Turner's work. And uh, I've been following a lot of those principles for years now, and they work really well. Okay, let's go to the Palo side. Okay, now the first thing I want to do is I want to remove that crown. So we're going to put in a throat screen. We're going to use... If you can hear me guys, we're having technical difficulties, just give us a second. Let's take that out so we're not choking. So um, we have a roaming camera today, so we'll be cutting to some of the roaming camera shots here as we go. And uh, hopefully we'll be using some special instrumentation today. We'll be using instruments that will help facilitate your viewing pleasure from the home. When we're all done today, at the very end, we'll, we'll have a, a, a last a uh, slide that we put up is going to have the details on how you can acquire your CE. And if you're watching this live, there's a, one way to do it. If you're watching this after the fact and you want CE, you can acquire that as well. And those details will be on the last, the last slide of the show today. What's going on? Your main camera's not showing. Main camera's not showing. It's on here, so it's going through the HDMI switter. It's not coming out. It's not. This isn't the issue. Okay. Why don't you have him just shoot into the mouth? Rob, will you just... The television? Okay, so shoot the TV is a better better one. All right. All right. All right, guys. Well, we got a little work around. We're using one of our cameras to film the other camera. Mm -hmm. So uh, these are the straight forceps. I don't, I don't use these on a day-in and day-out basis. I use these for video because um, what I usually use are the ash forceps, which are these forceps. And you've heard me talk many times about the mechanical advantage that this instrument gives. So for right now, what I'm going to do is I'm going to use this because the ash forcep gets in the view of the camera. 
and you can't see what we're going to do. So this is a uh, the crown that has fallen off it. It was temporarily bonded back in place. So we're just going to remove that gently. And I'm being very gentle here to remove it without damaging the adjacent crown. So that came off just the way we expected it to. Now at this point, we want to do an atraumatic extraction. We're going to use a, an instrument here that if you don't have this, is, this particular instrument in your arsenal and you're doing anterior aesthetic work, you definitely want to consider it. And that's the, uh, it's called the Cube uh, by Action. And uh, this is a piezo. So we put a nice little piezo, a piezo tome on here. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to start in the palate. And normally we would do mesial, distal, palatal. We never want to do it on the facial because we don't want that buccal bone to, to melt away. But in this case, because I want to really maintain the papilla in approximately, I'm going to start on the palate. And if I think I've got enough with just the palate, we're going to stop there. And what we'll do is we'll, we'll try to remove that root tip. I found that the best way to use this instrument is once you get a little purchase point and you step on the actuator, if you just rock it back and forth like this and just let it seep down beside the tube, it works really well. Okay, I'm going to extend that now a little bit to the, to the distal. Okay, that's good. Now, like I said, normally I would do interproximally, but in this case, I want to really maintain that bone so we get a good result. So let's see if we can use our straight forceps here. And we're going to apply just a little bit of rotating force here, okay? Okay. All right, and that's how we take out uh, anterior teeth atraumatically. So there's our, our root remnants out. So that went just like we thought it would. I'll give you a view of this in just a second. Let's go ahead and curatage and irrigation. This is a Hugh Freedy instrument as well. It's a, it's a um, serrated, thank you. I'm trying to blank on the word. It's a serrated curette that I love. Because we took that tooth out so easily with the atraumatic extraction, we didn't really traumatize the bone much. And if we don't get the bone to bleed, then we won't get a good bone graft integration. So I'm scraping the, the lamina dura. And the other thing I want to do is I want to check right now for bone on the facial. Okay, so piezo, or uh, peritone. My um, honeybee. You have a metal one? Okay, no worries. Honeybee just shows up better on the film. Okay, so I'm gonna use our perioprobe here. I'm gonna measure where that bone ends on the facial here, and it's two and a half inches. I mean, two and a half inches. I've been working as a carpenter over this holiday, uh, COVID holiday, and <laughs> inches are on my mind. It's two millimeters is what we're talking about here. So the bone is right there within two millimeters, and what that means is that the bony wall on the facial is intact means I do not need a collagen membrane here, okay? So what we're going to do is go ahead and place the surgical guide. And this was fabricated by Vulcan Donnell, and they do a, a very nice job of fabricating their guides. So the guide is down. We're going to verify that the guide is seated through the little viewing windows. So I'm looking at this through an, at an angle through the little viewing window here to make sure it's seated, and it is. It's a green cylinder. So we're going to follow the green protocol. This is the green uh, guide sleeve that goes inside. And then we follow that up with our, our 2 0 drill, our pilot drill. There's no sense in wasting any time in this hole. You go in and out quickly. So what we're doing is this particular guide system, a type four fully guided system, controls for position and depth. On the drill, there's a depth stop here. So all I'm doing is taking this all the way down to the depth stop. Each one of these drills is incrementally bigger in diameter. Okay. So today we're gonna to be placing a four two implant in diameter. 
So there's a soft bone protocol and a hard bone protocol. And we're just going to go to the regular bone protocol here. All right, this is our last drill. Okay. Now we're going to switch the motor over to implant mode, which it is done. The surgical report came in and it says that our stop position is stop position four. So I'm going to pick up my implant. This is a good one. I'm going to pick up my implant here and I'm going to carry it upside down. And my stop position has already been uh, set by my assistant before we started. So we're going to be able to come to the mouth now with this. And once again, I'm verifying that the speed has changed. This is a 4-2 implant going into position. And we're just going to wiggle it till it seats in the, in the socket and then lightly step on the rheostat. And what we're going to do is we're going to drive until that little piece of plastic right there called the snap link touches the top of our guide. Once we've done that, we know we're all the way down at the right depth. This is a prosthodontic driven protocol. So we're starting with the end in mind and then backing into the, backing into the surgical position. Okay, so I slipped off, so you have the uh, subcrestal. Okay, so my assistant's going to go get a different driver. This driver here is the one that comes in a standard kit, and it's their regular driver. And it has been replaced, not replaced, but you can get two drivers now, the standard one and the subcrestal one. So I didn't get all the way down to depth, so I'm hitting bone somewhere with this driver. So I'm going to go to the subcrestal driver. setting the stop position at SP4. So let me show you guys here. Is, that, is this camera working? Okay, let me show you here. We'll put the thro a new throat screen in. By the way, uh, I'm wearing blue gloves and my assistant's wearing green so you guys can tell who's doing what. But you, can you see the difference between these two drivers? This is the standard driver. This is the subcrestal driver. So it's, it's necked down in this region right here that allows me to get a little deeper. So I've gone ahead and placed the stop position in the SP4 position. We'll wiggle it until it engages the implant. And then we'll drive it down to time it until we get the timing right. So I am not engaging. Okay, so let's take the guide out and see what's, what's holding me up. Section. Thank you. So it is a green yellow. So I'm not going to drive it here. What I'm going to do is I'm just going to make sure that my driver is engaging properly. there. My driver is not wanting to engage. Yeah. And I don't want to wiggle it too much because if I wiggle it too much, I can wiggle that implant loose. By the way, our. No, we don't have a measurement here because we changed it.
There it goes. Yep, it went in. Okay. So it was just hanging up on, probably just catching on a part of the plastic on the driver there. So let's verify our distance, our depth looks good. And let me give you a mirror view here, guys, so you can see this as well. Yep. Okay. Okay, right there. So you can see we have an idealized placed uh, implant. So with the prosthodontic protocol, we start with the pros first. We back into that implant location. As you can see, it's designed for screw retain, so it's coming out through the cingulum of the tooth number eight. That's where we want it. So the guide has facilitated a very precise position. Accurate and precise is what we're looking for when we... Yeah. So what we're going to do real quick here is let me assess around it. We're going to place our healing cap, not a healing abutment, but our healing cap. And our healing cap looks like this. And it's color coded, it's yellow. So the driver was green, but the platform is yellow because it's platform switched, so the platform is a little smaller than the implant itself. So very carefully, I'm gonna place this into position, just finger tight. And now what I'm gonna do is I'm going to assess around my site to see where we might need to graft. So if there's a gap, yep, there's a gap, on the facial, and there almost always is a gap on the facial, and the reason is we want two millimeters of bone on the facial, or two millimeters of thickness, so that the implant doesn't show and that we maintain that bone. Well, if the implant's placed palatally so that we have screw access hole on the palate through the cingulum, then there's almost always a gap because that buccal wall is in the literature reports that that buccal wall is about a millimeter thick. So we're going to go ahead and graft. The lingual is obviously covered. With bone and the mesial and distal are actually engaging bone as well. So we have this nice little instrument from, from Hugh Freedy. It's a curved pocket packer. It's, it's, a, it's a condenser that's curved, which allows me to get down around the sides and then on the facial of these implants. Yep. My assistant will bring the uh, Mineros, is what we're using today, it's a cortical concilis mix, and she brings it to the site, and then what I do is I slide right off the top into the extraction site, and then we're just going to lightly tap this into position. And this is where that curved, see how that curve works? So if you didn't have this curved instrument, it's difficult to get the bone graft down around the facial of a, a round implant, a cylindrical implant, because you can't get, you can't actually get in there. So that's doing well. A little gauze, please. So the gauze comes in, it helps to wick up the extra saliva and fluids and I don't think we're going to need any more than that. So the graft is going uh, to be just one spoonful today because we've got really good bone. If you notice that the tooth looked a little bit blunted on the original radiograph, probably uh, due to childhood trauma or orthodontic procedures. Um, so there was an ample amount of bone apical to the socket, I need just a little rinse in there, just a, um, actually not a rinse, but a gauze. So we used our five thread rule, our five thread guideline. And the five thread guideline states that when designing for primary stability, when designing for it, so trying to predict it in your prosthodontic portion of the plan, you want to make sure that you have five threads of the implant that you're planning to place engaging in bone. And 
in this case, we had three full threads plus more than five partial threads on either side. So we had, so the, the five thread rule says five, five threads, but if you have three full threads and then you have partial threads on the mesial and on the, on the distal, you'll still have your likelihood of primary stability. So that's how we predicted that we would get good primary stability with this case. So what happened there just a second ago, which has never happened before, a piece of bone particle got into the, the screw hole for the cover screw. So, never happened before, but it's going to happen today. So we're just really lightly removing this healing cap. You want to make sure there's no any off axis loads to your driver here. The driver needs to remain very, very inline, collinear with, with your uh, implant so that you don't wiggle the implant loose. Because remember, the five thread rule is prediction for primary stability. But if you wiggle that to the left or the right, you'll, you'll wiggle it loose. Okay, so here's our prefabricated PMMA temporary on a non-indexed text, a non-indexed abutment, okay? Non-indexed because we're not quite sure exactly what, where our timing was gonna be. So instead of having to deal with that, we do a non-indexed. So the implant goes in Sorry, the pros goes in, and then we're just going to lightly tighten it, and that's going to help hold our bone graft in position. It's going to support our, our soft and hard tissues, okay? So we got a little bit of an opening. Let's see if that closes down when we tighten it up here. So not bad, not bad. It's got a little bit of a gap on the mesial um, that we can, I think we can live with. So remember the non-indexed for these immediate deliveries, the non-indexed is, is critical. When we go for the final, we'll have a, a hybrid indexed hybrid tie base. Okay, so for the final. So what I'm doing is I'm just going to finger tight here and I'm still feeling a little bit of, of give, so okay, I think I'm down. So take a look at this real quick. So that's what we're talking about. Do you see how if you just look at one thing, guys, look at how beautiful we're supporting the hard and soft tissue with this provisional. It's just really, really nicely formed right there. Okay, ready to grab? So we're going to take our radiograph, and then we'll go to the back, back wall here in a second. Okay. And you can, yeah, just, yep, yeah, no, that's fine right there, it's fine. So you can see, Sarah, will you just point to the one we, that we worked on so that they know which one's today? So that's today, and the one in the seven position was previously placed by by another surgeon. But this, this one here is us today, and you can see it split the difference. It didn't get knocked off this hard bone, and we were able to maintain the papilla on the mesial and distal and the hard tissue without flapping. So we really like that prosthodontic-driven protocol. And that's it. Um, come back to the... Rob, will you come back here? And just take a look at this. We're going to check this... Uh, Make sure that it's not an occlusion. We won't want this to be functional. We want it non-functioning. But this is just a beautiful, beautiful outcome. And this provisional will help to support the soft tissue, support the hard tissue, maintain or retain the bone graft. So it's, it's a great solution. And you have to have patient compliance. And in this case, knowing our patient is a spectacular patient, we know that they're not going to try to bite through, you know, a, a brittle cookie when they leave here. So we, we could do this. In other cases where you have a patient and you say, 
I don't think they're going to be able to not eat on that tooth, and you wouldn't want to do this. You want to do uh, some other provisional re restoration. But do you want uh, maybe take the occlusion on film? Or you uh, no. So, guys, we're going to do normal occlusion adjustment now, and you guys, everyone knows how to do that. So what we're going to do is we're going to check this tooth here. I don't want to waste your time. We're just going to check it and make sure that it's out of occlusion. So it's an aesthetic. It's the show tooth. It's showing uh, the tooth, but it's not... Um, it's not in function. Doctor, uh, quick question. Yes. Somebody mentioned the other day. What's the name of your mouth prop? Uh, this mouth prop is called an Optrigate. It's sold by Avaclard Vivident. And uh, we love this. We love this for a couple reasons. It protects the patient's lips. Here's, here it is in a package. So that's the first thing. It protects the patient's lips. The second thing is, because of its milky white sh uh, sh color, the light bounces around. And look how much light we have inside the oral cavity. So it really lights up the oral cavity nicely for us and shows, uh, you know, what we want to see. So we, we like that product a lot. Do we have any other questions? So what we're going to do here, guys, we're going to throw up a slide here at the end for you. Uh, there's a quick couple of questions, one on the five-thread guideline. By the way, the five-thread guideline was published in the Journal of Oral Implantology in February edition this year, 2020. And so you're welcome to get that. It's a, it's a free download on the internet, so you can find that. It's the five-thread guideline. If you type that in, you'll find that. And that talks to the details around where we came up with the five-thread guideline. And, uh, and we use it on every single case. And we're planning on uh, putting out another paper shortly that shows how successful we've been with using the five-thread guideline. So we used it today. Once again, remember, when you're doing this, if you have five threads that are engaging on the, on, on the mesial and distal, they don't have to be completely circumferential around your implant. And I like to say, if you're taking a hot dog and turning it on the grill, you can pick that hot dog up with a pair of tongs on either side, right? On the left side and the right side of the hot dog, and you can turn that hot dog over. You don't have to grab all the way around the hot dog in order to move the hot dog. So in this case, if we have good bone on the mesial and good bone on the, on the distal, and we engage both of those walls, so by socket stabilization, with five threads on the computer when we do our digital prosthodontic driven protocol. If we have that, then we have a high likelihood that we'll be able to get the implant in at the time of surgery, which is what we did today. And uh, just, just a lovely outcome. So I, I have uh, no real concerns about how this is going to heal. Do we provide a night guard for our patients? For patients that are uh, that need a night guard or or uh, already in a night guard, yeah, absolutely. For any high risk scenarios, so for this particular case, when I take this out of occlusion, if I feel like there's some parafunction that it might be damaged, then we will. Yeah, absolutely. Okay, thanks guys for tuning in. Chris, I couldn't be happier with the way it turned out. It looks so. Good.